What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. I am Nicholas. That is Noah at FB God. We're switching things up a little bit today, talking dynasty. I know a large portion of the audience will soon start to transition over to their dynasty fantasy football teams. The redraft leagues are almost done. We are heading into week 13. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving as well, so happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the time with your families, as you can see. Noah, um, as the respectful person that he is, went home, is enjoying time with his family. Thus, there is no bunk beds in the background. He's got somewhat good lighting going on there, so don't be too disappointed. Uh, I'd imagine our comment section is going to be about 50% fewer because there are no bunk beds in the background. Either way, we got a lot of good information coming your way on tap. We're talking about trade targets for Dynasty Fantasy Football. Not even necessarily sell high or buy low, um, but just guys that I think you should have in mind when you're going through the offseason because right now we have, you know, the offseason is about four months long before the NFL draft hits and you have a lot of time to start maneuvering trades. And this is probably my favorite time to make trades. I know a lot of people like to do them in season, but those are kind of hard to um, hard to pull off successfully because you're looking towards the future, but at the same time, you're also trying to win a championship within that season. So I like to uh, make trades usually in the preseason. I like to make trades in the off season because you know a little bit more about what you have. You know a little bit more about the shape that your team is going to take and like the identity of a team. So almost like a real life NFL franchise, you could start looking at your team in a much easier way rather than trying to guess and project what someone's going to do over the course of the season while it's mid season dynasty fantasy football. Noah, are we ready to go? Born ready. Fuck yeah. Let's hit that intro. All right, our first buy candidate that we have today is Josh Allen. Now, the reason I'm super high on Josh Allen is because I don't think public perception around him is that I don't think that people believe that he's like a top 10 to top 12 dynasty quarterback just because his name is Josh Allen. He's on the Buffalo Bills, and he's not really the best real-life quarterback. I mean, if you look at like him from a fantasy perspective, though, first off, the guy's 23 years old. He's got a long shelf life because he, he's only two years in the league. But everything he's shown this season – is that he's improving not only as a runner, just like learning that he doesn't have to run every like two dropbacks, but as a passer, right? His completion percentage has went up 7.4%. Um, he actually has weapons in the passing game, which I think is a big part of that because last year he had two guys, Zay Jones and Kelvin Benjamin, that you probably didn't even know were in the NFL until week one. Um, on top of that, his interception percentage went down from 3.8 to 2.3%, and his touchdown percent went up from 3.1 to 4.4%. So overall, him as a passer, um, he's getting much better. They have really young weapons in Dawson Knox upcoming. Uh, Devin Singletary out of the backfield is pretty solid. And just their team as a whole is pretty set, like defensively. Um, I know their offensive line is pretty decent. So these upcoming years, they might add some wide receivers through the draft to really solidify that passing game for Josh Allen. Um, those passing numbers will continue to increase. And just him on the ground for fantasy purposes has been huge, right? He's on pace for over 550 rushing yards this season. There have only been two quarterbacks in the entire like NFL history that have had 500 rushing yards in back-to-back -back seasons um, from their rookie season to their sophomore season. It was Lamar Jackson this season. Right now he's doing it. And Cam Newton. So he really gives you that upside and that like continuity of rushing on the ground that you need for a top 10 to top 12 quarterback uh, year over year to give you that solid floor. And if you think about it, right? This season, like when uh, weekly rankings come out, Josh Allen is consistently in like that top 10 to top 12 quarterback range. So why shouldn't he be valued as a top 10 to top 12 dynasty quarterback when he's probably only going to get better as a passer as his weapons improve? Like right now, Cole Beasley is his wide receiver too. If that improves and he just keeps his upward trend of like throwing the ball better, um, he's going to continue to be a better quarterback and probably work his way into like that top eight guy because he's still very young. He has like the work on the ground and the coach uh, the coaching staff and the team as a whole has committed to him like as a passer, despite not him not being like the best in that area of the game yet. So I'm completely in on buying Josh Allen and super flex leagues. It's going to be tough unless somebody already has like two or three quarterbacks um, to ship him off. If you only have two quarterbacks, it's probably going to be impossible. But as Nick was saying in the intro, like dynasty leagues, uh, the drafts coming around in three, four months, people are really intrigued with the unknown. You could probably get him for like a first round pick, like a mid to late first round pick. And I'd be completely in on it because if you look at the quarterback class incoming, 
like two is injured right now. He might need to rehab. You could probably get him next year at a discount if he doesn't play in the rookie season because I'm already seeing guys like Dwayne Haskins go for a discount. Um, and Jake from not Jake from uh, Joe Burrow. He's a little bit older. People might be off of him. So if you can get him for a first round pick, especially in super flex leagues, um, I'd be all over that price tag. Yeah. I mean, if you own Josh Allen in dynasty, you're super excited about it because you took a giant risk on drafting him just because his college completion percentage and his overall accuracy was a huge concern. But as we've learned over time, you know, the rushing statistics as a quarterback play just as big of a role um, as the passing statistics in today's NFL. And I mean, Josh Allen, like if you're a Bills fan, there's no way to really quantify this, but even not as a Bills fan, just an NFL, you know, avid watcher, it, it feels more and more like as the weeks go by that Josh Allen is their franchise quarterback. He's you know, electric. While, He's so fun to watch. Yeah. And, and like for a while, you just didn't get that. There was always like something in the back of your head, like, oh, you know, when's he going to blow it? When's this like charade going to be done? But more and more, you're like, Josh Allen is the guy for them. There's like, there's no way they're looking at another quarterback over the next, you know, year, two years, three years, whatever. They're going to see what they have through their five year rookie contract with Josh Allen. First, uh, first round draft capital, top 10 draft capital, right? And when you look at some of the numbers, like that you want to see improvement on Josh Allen hits those marks. And I think one of the more telling numbers was the fact that he led the NFL last year in terms of percentage of his throws that were deep balls, right? As a rookie, you get very hectic in, in the pocket. And with Josh Allen, he was either chucking the ball deep or he was trying to run and scramble for his life. He led the NFL last year, 19 and a half percent of his throws went deep. That's, that's a very high number compared to the rest of the NFL this year. It dropped all the way down to around, let me see, 12.9%, which is 16th among quarterbacks. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're better or worse as a quarterback. But for me, it, it feels like Josh Allen is going through his reads more. It feels like he has, is working the ball around more rather than just as soon as he gets under pressure, he chucks it deep. So that's one of the indicators I see with Josh Allen. The other thing is, like you said, highest, uh, a very high adjusted completion percentage compared to where he was last year. He's around 74% right now, which takes into account uh, throwaways and drop passes and things like that. That 74% is among, you know, the top in the NFL. He's right. Uh, he's above James Winston, obviously, who's been very erratic, but he's right underneath Patrick Mahomes. He's right around where Tom Brady is. He's above Carson Wentz, Matt Stafford, uh, you know, those guys. So he's in legit territory when it comes to his completion percentage. Right now, he's quarterback five in fantasy. So like you said, like week in, week out, we perennially put him as a top 10 fantasy quarterback. So why would that be any different from a dynasty perspective, if this team is going to buy into him for the next four or five years, if not longer, if he continues to play well, that means he's going to be a fantasy quarterback that's very, very good for you for also those next three, four, five, six, seven years, whatever, because of the fantasy, because of the rushing uh, ability that he gives you. So there's a lot of markers there that I really like with Josh Allen. Like you said, this offense, they 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 made a big investment to this offense this offseason, signing multiple running backs, drafting running backs, signing multiple wide receivers for his weapons core, drafting Dawson Knox and these tight ends. Uh, signing about five or six different offensive linemen. So they were like, you know, they bought in the same way that Lamar Jackson is completely making that offense about him in Baltimore. Buffalo is like a, is like a Baltimore, um, a Baltimore light right now in the way that they're building around Josh Allen and they keep giving him different pieces to work around. And you saw just how big of an improvement Josh Allen took from year to year. So if he had stayed stagnant and we're still seeing like on and off boom bust games from fantasy wise for Josh Allen, I'd still be a little bit hesitant. I don't know if I'd be bought in. But for right now, like the way Josh Allen is trending and just – he's also like giving you a floor. He's not a boomer bust quarterback anymore in fantasy. He's giving you like 17, 18 points every single week. So no matter how bad he plays, he's still giving you a very good fantasy floor and you will have those boom weeks because of the, the rushing upside that he gives you. So with Josh Allen, I just love the direction of the franchise. And that, you know, it speaks a lot about dynasty assets and their value going forward. Yeah, and on top of that, like, you'd expect this team to want to run a lot this year because their defense is very good and because they have, like, Frank Gore isn't a great running back, but he can get you, like, three and a half yards of carry. They also have Devin Singletary, and Josh Allen has his legs. The fact that they're committing to him throwing the ball just shows that going forward, they're probably going to invest in the passing game even more heavily. Maybe in this draft, they get, like, a bigger body wide receiver, like a Michael Pittman, like an Antonio Gandy-Golden, somebody like that in the later rounds that can actually give him a big target deep down the field instead of having like two five foot eight guys running around, which I know they're good receivers, but as long as he just keeps getting more and more weapons, and as long as the team gets more chemistry as a whole, uh, the, the sky's the limit really for Josh Allen. He's basically like Cam Newton, like 90% of what Cam Newton was. Yeah, it, it's pretty uh, shocking the turn that he made this year. So I'm in on, on Josh Allen. Another guy that y'all need to be buying right now is Darius Geis, the running back for the Washington Redskins. 
I, I, his injuries, obviously, we'll touch on the injuries in a second, but like they are far overshadowing the prospect that Darius Geis is or was and the running back that he currently is right now. Like I want to remind you all just how good he was coming out of college because he checks every single box as a running back prospect that I look for. He's got the workhorse size, 5'11", 225, speed, 4'49", which is in the 90th percentile for weight-adjusted speed score. And my single-handedly most important thing to look at is being a good football player, like production at the college level. 1,500 yards from scrimmage his sophomore year, 1,400 yards from scrimmage his junior year, 29 touchdowns between the two years, averaging 6.3 yards per carry during that span. And most importantly, he did it in the SEC. Like the season he averaged 7.6 yards per carry, which was his sophomore year, he saw a stacked box against SEC defenders on 73% of his carries, which was by far, in a way, the highest percentage of his class. That Power 5 conference, like being in that, is so big for me when I'm looking at running backs and their college production. Like first and foremost, you need to prove to me that you're good at football. So he has the size, he has the NFL speed, he's been very good at the college level in a very tough conference. And like, let me remind you, during that sophomore year where he broke out, he was competing with Leonard Fournette. Like, make sure you're understanding this. Like, I understand Leonard Fournette was banged up throughout most of that year. He played in, I think, eight games, but he still touched the ball 144 times, scored eight times, and had about 1,000 yards from scrimmage. In that season, Geis went for 1,500 yards from scrimmage and 16 touchdowns while Leonard Fournette was in that backfield. Um, the, the, probably the most questionable part of his game would be the pass-catching ability. His highest reception total in a season was only 18, which would normally be a red flag. I want to see, you know, at least one season of like the 24 to 30 range, let me know that you're a good pass catcher. But I mean, it's at, it's at LSU. All they do is run the ball. Like I was looking at some of their numbers going back to his breakout seasons. 2016, their quarterback threw the ball 269 times. Their running backs had 390 carries. 2017, their quarterback threw the ball 275 times. Their running backs 416 carries. So yes, the overall raw reception totals were a little bit lower, but that's a product of the LSU offense. They are a run first team and they will always be a run first team. And we also just saw Darius guys take like a 45 yard screen pass to the crib on an NFL field. So, you know, he's already Derek showing. Yeah, he, honestly, it was a very Derek Henry esque thing. So if they get him involved more, like if Derek Henry got more screen passes, I mean, he, he drops like half of them, but if he can catch half of those, he would so, bust out like a few more 60 yard uh, touchdown runs and we'd still throw him on our sell high list. Anyways, the injury history is concerning. Uh, that has been the biggest defactor for Darius Geis and what his value has been through, um, through his two years in the NFL so far. He tore his ACL his, the summer of his rookie year. But we know like we want these running backs two years removed from their ACL, not the first year removed, right? And then he pulled his hamstring and it was just a whole mess with the infections and a lot of nonsense going on with Darius Geis' knees. But if you look at a guy like Dalvin Cook, two years removed from the ACL, he, he took the same path, bro, tore the ACL, following year, pulled the hamstring, and everything just got nuts, right? And then this year, Dalvin Cook had the breakout. So I envision something similar to a Dalvin Cook-esque, maybe a Dalvin cook light kind of breakout for Darius Geis next year. This will be his third year in the league. And we have to obviously, you know, take the situation into account. Looking at the backfield here, we have Adrian Peterson. It'll be interesting to see what they do this year. But if you look at the contract, the way it's set up, they can get out of Adrian Peterson's contract after this year with only 750 k as the dead cap. But if they, if they keep them, it's going to be $3 million towards their cap hit, which makes sense for them to kind of let them go. Maybe they'll keep them around for a depth thing. Um, but if you, if you go back to even when Darius Geis was drafted, and this summer as well, they looked at Darius Geis as a three-down player. They talked about how he was going to be the workhorse for this team. Um, obviously, the injuries have not let us see that and, and see that come to fruition yet. But I like the odds of that happening in 2020. You look at Chris Thompson. He's going to be an undrafted free agent after this season. Um, so there's no way they resign him given all the injuries that he's gone through. Bryce Love redshirted his entire rookie season in the NFL. We'll, we'll see if he ever kind of gets right. We'll see what happens with Bryce Love and if he's a factor into this backfield. I would imagine Bryce Love being more of a pass catcher uh, in this offense, which obviously limits Geis' ceiling. But like you said with Derrick Henry, and I kind of look at this as a Nick Chubb situation, you're not going to have to rely on the pass catching work from Darius Geis in order to uh, reap the benefits of like an RB1 in fantasy football because the running – ability that he gives you is just so so strong obviously they haven't been efficient this year but no one in that backfield has considering the offense is a mess you don't have to worry about the quarterback because they've had terrible quarterback play their offensive line has been subpar at best they've been missing their best lineman the entire year um so I absolutely love Geis there's nothing about his profile that tells me 
that you should be scared off other than the injuries. But two years removed from the ACL, I'm all ready to roll in on guys. I actually made a move last or two weeks ago. I traded my 2021st, so this upcoming year's first round pick for Darius guys straight up now. I was, I am 11 and one in that league. I clinched the first round by. So at the very worst, I gave away the 109. Um, and there, it's more likely that I'll probably be giving away the 111 or the 112. So that is 100% a swap that I'm willing to make. Because if I look at this year's class, and I think that's also something to consider when you're swapping uh, first round picks or just looking at dynasty value in general. Like, where would you take Darius guys this year? I'm not, he wouldn't be the 101, probably not the 102, because this is a very strong running back class between like DeAndre Swift, Jonathan Taylor guys like that. But I think Darius guys at worst would be like the 106 or the 107 and probably, uh, you know, top three or four among running backs in the class had he come out this year. So the fact that I can swap like a 110 or 111 is something that I was happy to do. And I accepted that trade within like five seconds of, of getting the offer. Um, shout out to Scott. Thank you for Darius guys, by the way. And now I feel good about Darius guys. And if you can swap a late first round pick in this upcoming draft class, do that. Yeah, an underrated thing about doing that, swapping a player for a pick, is we already know Darius Geis' landing spot. Like, what if Jonathan Taylor, I know it probably won't happen, it definitely won't happen. What if he, like, goes to the Giants? Or just a situation where, like, he's stuck behind somebody who isn't quite, like, out of the league yet. Like, I know Nick Chubb was stuck behind Carlos Hyde, and pretty much the entire world could see Carlos Hyde was done that season. But, like, what if the landing spot isn't great? Or maybe the guy you pick at 109, uh, maybe a lower end running back or wide receiver takes a few years to break out because they're kind of in the doghouse to start a career like a Rashad Penny. We already know Darius Geis is the starter there. We already know that and Adrian Peterson is like 100 years old. Chris Thompson can't stay healthy. And that's kind of like the theme of the Redskins, which is why people um, aren't really in on Darius Geis right now. But like he has the job. The team shows commitment and they show that they want to use him. Um, not maybe, maybe not in all three downs, but they want to use him in all phases of the game. Um, and coming off of like two injuries already and he's coming back and like breaking off 40 yard plays like you said um, I think he has a catch in every single game he's played this year like he definitely has the juice to be like a top 10 running back and as this team progresses like maybe maybe Dwayne Haskins isn't the answer but that's just going to help them lean on Darius Geis even more and another underrated thing is like it doesn't like he it's not like he lost too much tread on the tires in college right he only had 503 uh, touches during his time at LSU by comparison, Saquon had 770 touches at uh, Penn State. It's 270 more. It's like basically an entire season. Uh, Leonard Fournette had 657. Nick Chubb at 789. So um, he, just because he got injured early in his career doesn't mean he's like weathered and he's going to break down every single season. I know that he's like on the Redskins, so it might seem that way. But um, I'm completely in on buying him because he does have that talent. Uh, he does have that pedigree. And he's in a situation where we know he's going to be the lead back for years to come. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm all in. On, I'm going to grab Darius Geis. I want to stay within that same offense. It does kind of worry me that I'm going all in on the Washington Redskins right now because that franchise is horrible and the, the leadership from top down is really, really poor and that usually translates to on-the-field success. But I cannot get enough of this dude, Terry McLaurin. Like, I want – all I want all of the Terry McLaurin's. And I was I've been, so wrong on him in the soft season when we were like watching film and stuff. I thought he was just a burner. This guy is fantastic. He's this guy so is like a true player. alpha in today's NFL. Like in every sense of the way that the NFL operates today, McLaurin is the alpha. And I have I, I wrote down just the, tons of stats and just where he ranks right now. So amongst rookie wide receivers, this this entire class of rookie wide receivers was just unbelievable, and they're just the next wave of you know dominant uh, producers on the outside. Terry McLaurin, amongst these really, really good rookie wide receivers, first in yards with 638, tied for first in receptions, 40 with Debo, tied for first in touchdowns, first in average depth of target, first in air yards, second in targets overall, fourth in yards per route run. And amongst the entire NFL group of wide receivers, he's third in contested catch rate, fourth in weighted opportunity behind only Michael Thomas, DeAndre Hopkins, Devontae Adams, third in target premium, fifth in dominator rating, which is the sign of a true alpha on their respective team that takes into account like yards, touchdowns that you accumulate via receptions and receiving and things like that. So you are like dominating your offense in that respect. 12th in QB rating when targeted, 10th in fantasy points per target. If you look at his raw numbers, he's currently on a 16 game pace for 64 catches, 1,021 yards and eight touchdowns. Like there are very, very, very few rookies who go over 1,000 yards receiving it's like that. let me yeah. let me cut you off really quick I just agree. to put that into perspective these are the teams he's played right the Cowboys the Bears the Patriots the 49ers the Vikings the Bills and the Lions who have Darius Slay those are all like they all have top tier cornerbacks and he's still on pace for over a thousand yards with the quarterbacks he's had he's just a, like a great football player and 
I don't know. I agree with you. You have to buy in a guy who has this type of talent. Yeah, I was like, I was just about to say he's doing all of this despite getting shadowed by all of the top opposing cornerbacks. Like when Bill puts Stefan Gilmore on you as a as a shadow, like you, that should tell you all you really need to know. And he's also doing this despite awful quarterback play. His target accuracy ranks 77th among NFL wide receivers per player profile right now. And, and like, you know, there, there has been so much production left on the field. Like Terry McLaurin could legitimately be an easy top 10 fantasy wide receiver right now if like – three throws haven't been overthrown he had a 60 yard bomb that was called back on a dumb holding penalty last week like he's been overthrown on so many touchdowns this year and it, the co- the competition for targets going forward even solidify like more so solidifies the fact that he will be the alpha for the Redskins for a long time like when you watch him on the field like he just pops off right when you're watching him he's on like TV. Stephon Diggs it's yeah. what he reminds me of exactly he's like a bigger version of Stephon Diggs he's like six foot 208 like at four, three, five speed. It's all these things that you didn't really, it kind of flew under the radar, obviously, because going back to his college days, um, he was the number two target at Ohio state behind Paris Campbell pretty much. But like that, that translated into the NFL in a way that I couldn't have ever imagined. Like you said, it wasn't a guy that like popped off to me on tape when I watched him in college, but now he's the alpha. Like it's Paul Richardson, which is possibly the worst current NFL contract, like, I don't think Henry's still getting paid, so I mean, there's five years, forty five years, forty million dollars, but he's out again. He's dealt with so many injuries over the last couple of years. It's really just like Kelvin Harmon behind him, who's like a sixth round pick, could develop into a nice complementary possession receiver. But this is this offense is all Terry McLaurin going forward. Like a few guys that I would easily flip for Terry McLaurin right now, just straight up: T.Y. Hilton, Tyler Lockett, uh, Will Fuller, Tyler Boyd, Adam Thielen, John Brown, like all of those guys that have you know three, four years on Terry McLaurin easy flip I'm, I'm even actually throwing out offers I'm trying to move Julio for Terry McLaurin plus right now because you just have so many I mean Julio is like 30 plus 30 years old 30 and a half and Terry McLaurin just came into the league so like I, I think Terry is is a real thing and he's going to be like a top 12 fantasy wide receiver for the next you know x number of years I'm all in on this kid yeah the only one I disagree with you on that that you named was Tyler Lockett and I have him as a guy to buy and the only reason for that is he's only 27 years old which is like right in a wide receiver's prime and that is perfectly aligned with Russell Wilson in his prime and we've seen that he's the like the alpha receiver in that passing game even with DK Metcalf there uh, Tyler Lockett still gets his targets and I know DK Metcalf only has like eight or nine less targets than Lockett this year but that's also keeping in mind that last game he got banged up And this past Sunday, I think they only threw the ball like 20 times. It was like some ridiculously low rate. So um, obviously the target numbers aren't as high as like other alpha receivers, but just everything he's shown thus far in his career, like every year, year after year, Tyler Lockett just gets better and better. And the fact that he's paired with probably the best quarterback in the league, I know Lamar Jackson's getting a ton of hype, but I don't think you'd find too much of an argument for people to say that like Russell Wilson's the best all around quarterback in the league right now. Um, for him to continue to grow with Wilson, I think he's going to give you three to like two or three more like top 10, top 12 seasons. And keep in mind, like Doug Baldwin in this offense was a top 10 guy, despite not being athletic at all and just being a slot receiver. If Tyler Lockett loses like that speed as he gets older, I could see him just moving into the slot and playing that Doug Baldwin role with Russell Wilson, just getting open. Like the chemistry that those two have, I'd say only like Brady and Julian Edelman have that type of chemistry on the field where like, the guy can improvise in his zone coverage or on a broken play, he can just get open. Um, I think he's just going to be a guy who's going to rack up catches and touchdowns for years to come. So I probably wouldn't trade him for uh, Terry McLaurin just because we know what his product production is going to be in the foreseeable future. But Julio Jones, I kind of agree. We've seen Matt Ryan get banged up a few times this year and Julio, um, he's always like sitting out of practice, but he always laces him up come Sunday. But um, yeah, him like Tyler Lockett or T.Y. Hilton also, I agree with you. I'd probably sell him for uh, both guys I really like, but I think I'd rather have Tyler Lockett at this point than Terry McLaurin. Yeah, my only problem with Tyler Lockett is I felt as if this was the perfect storm for him this year of fantasy. Like I like all summer, I I basically um, I, I was all I, I stand Tyler Lockett more than I like any other player. I just it, it was just so obvious that he was going to see so much volume from Russell Wilson, but I feel like this was I, I want to say a one year rental, but I feel as if the numbers that he ends up with this year will not be what we see year over year. I think he's closer to like, he already has a career high in targets right now. We're 11 games into the season. He's around, I think 78 or 80 targets. And prior to this 71 was his career high in targets. So he's going to smash all of his career high numbers, 
But I think when all is said and done over the next few years, we're going to see him closer to that 100 target guy. Um, and, and that could be very, that, that will be very valuable because he is a guy that makes a lot of plays downfield and he's a, uh, developing into a touchdown guy for Russell Wilson. And of course he has Russell Wilson, but I think like you see Seattle trying to develop the entire weapons group. And I think over, you know, the next year or two, we're going to see obviously DK Metcalf continue to progress. They get their tight ends very involved in this offense as well to run first offense too. So I think we're going to see like Tyler Lockett be very good, but I don't think he has a ceiling that Terry McLaurin has. Like I, I legit think Terry McLaurin could be a guy that gets 140 plus targets over the next five years straight. And I just see Tyler Lockett closer to the 100 to 110 range. And, you know, you have to give and take depending on, would you rather have a hundred targets from Russell Wilson? Would you rather have 140 targets from Dwayne Haskins? Probably the former, uh, but that's just my opinion. I just, I just think that like, like Tyler Lockett is a guy that I have in uh, one of my dynasty leagues. And I actually sent out a trade proposal this morning while I was doing research on Terry. Um, I, I forget the exact details, but it ha- involved me moving Tyler Lockett for Terry McLaurin. It already got shot down because I probably threw in like a bunch of other ignorant players within that trade. But I, I will say like, I'll take Terry McLaurin very, very slightly over Tyler Lockett. I'm a little bit lower. I just feel like this, this could bite me in the ass, but I feel like this season for Tyler Lockett is going to be his career high statistically because everything just lined up for him this year. And uh, I, I just don't see them having less competition for targets next year. I don't see them having as bad of a defense next year where they need to throw the ball a ton. So um, it's obviously Tyler Lockett's a guy you have to like from a talent perspective. I just don't know if long-term we're going to see anywhere near the ceiling that he provides this year. Yeah, I think what you just said is perfect. Like the long term, if you want to be in a win now mode, I think I'd like I'd much rather have Tyler Lockett for these next two seasons. But if you're playing the long game, I know McLaurin's like a little bit older for a rookie. He's either 23 or 24 years old. But the Washington Redskins offense can't get any worse than it is right now. And we're seeing Terry McLaurin be like a top 24 receiver. So I agree. If you're playing the long game, definitely go for Terry McLaurin. Now, another thing to bring up is just second year receivers in general, right? We've seen A.J. Brown. We've seen D.K. Metcalf. We've seen Debo Samuel and Terry McLaurin. They've all broken out in their rookie year. But we have to look at guys who, in their rookie season, really didn't produce, but come in the second year and just absolutely blow up. This season's like Johnson. Dude, I love Deontay Johnson. That's another guy I didn't like. So maybe I'm just not good at, like, watching film. But uh, we've seen this year, like, Cortland Sutton, uh, DJ Moore. I know he had a great rookie season, but he's being – like, he's a fantastic player right now. Um, Christian Kirk, James Washington, Michael Gallup, even Auden Tate. Like, these are guys that – in seasonal leagues probably weren't being touched other than Sutton and DJ Moore. Um, even DJ Chark, like people probably forgot he was a player because even last year, like on a very shallow depth chart, he got little to no run this season. He's like a fringe top 12 receiver. So you got to look at guys who have that pedigree, who have that athleticism, who have that college production that didn't produce the first year in the league, but are still in good situations. And those are guys I'm going to go out and try to acquire. Like you look at a uh, Nikhil Harry, right? I know his price is extremely high, but he's in the Patriots offense. He had a great touchdown catch this past week. He's a guy I want to buy. J.J. Arcega, Whiteside. Like, the Eagles receiving group is either really old or just has no depth because uh, Zach Ertz, I think, is 30. Uh, Alshon Jeffrey's never been able to stay on the field. Nelson Aguilar is just terrible. So, J.J. Arcega, Whiteside, he's a guy I really like coming out of Stanford. Um, they, have a, they have a young quarterback who isn't very good, but he's probably just going to pepper him with targets. He could be a decent guy in his second season. Paris Campbell, second-round pick on the Colts. Um, he's not so reliant on deep balls, even though he is like a speedster. So if Jacoby Brissett just wants to keep dumping the ball up, he's a perfect fit. Other guys like Andy Isabella, Preston Williams, and as you said, Deontay Johnson, those are all guys with pretty cheap price tags right now that I'd go out and buy because after the rookie season and once the rookie draft comes around, people start to forget about who were first and second round picks last year. And as that starts to wash away, you can acquire them for like third round rookie picks. And if you can do that and just get a guy who just one year ago was seen as like, oh, maybe he can be a top 24 receiver as early as his rookie year, then you can really capitalize on that value. Yeah, this was a point that I hammered home in uh, one of the videos over the summer. I think it was a Dynasty Trade Targets video actually as well. Um, And in the the Dynasty Draft Guide that me and Noah are going to be working on this offseason. So stay tuned for that. If y'all thought the redraft guide was good, this will be uh, new and improved because last year was the first year that we put together the Dynasty Guide, but we'll have a lot more in store for y'all to help you out during the offseason, hopefully do dominate your dynasty leagues but when we look at second year wide receivers like the, you look at it from a common sense standpoint because we have these few months in between the end of the season up until the nfl draft where these rookies just get an insane amount of hype so this is like useful for trading but also use, useful for startup drafts as well 
because people are going to start valuing these rookie wide receivers ahead of the second year wide receivers because they get so much hype. You hear their names over and over and over and over again. So you, you're, you're so excited to get them on your team. You start drafting them above the sophomore wide receivers for the most part. This, is, this was a, a, an out-of-bounds year for rookie wide receivers in terms of production. But usually, you know, 75 to 80% of rookie wide receivers don't produce. Thus, their value goes from this at the NFL draft. After the first year, it takes a dip because they don't produce as a rookie. However, like you should expect that. That should be the norm. So when you're buying a rookie or a second-year wide receiver, I should say, after their rookie year, you get them at a diminished value but you also get that rookie year production that isn't going to be there behind them. And then they start progressing as a player. So there are a lot of guys like the Marquise Browns, the Terry McLaurins, the DK Metcalfs, you know, those kind of guys, Debo Samuel, even at this point that are producing heavily at their rookie year, you won't be able to get those guys at the discounts, but it is like the Deontay Johnson types and the other guys that he named that you'll be able to get at a rookie discount because they didn't produce as a rookie but the hype was there, you know, pre-draft. Everyone gets hype pre-draft because that's just the way that social media works nowadays. So doesn't it seem like people are talking about the 2019 class like it sucked? Like, they're like oh, yeah, the receiver class is nothing compared to 2020 when just like eight months ago we were saying it was the best class since 2014. Yeah, like I, I didn't understand that wave. You know, that's the fucked up part about Dynasty and why I like don't even want to get into it this offseason is just, there's just so much nonsense that goes into it and just so much noise. It was like, oh, this is one of the best classes that we've seen in a long time. And then, like, the NFL draft came, people were like, yeah, not, they were never really that good. It's like, that's not what you just said for the last three months. I had always stuck with the, the, the opinion that they were a very good class. But there are a lot of under-the-radar guys, like, I, like we had talked about. Deontay Johnson, Terry McLaurin were not guys that I really saw being breakout candidates. Um, but they proved to be much, much better than I had ever imagined. So those are the guys that I want to be buying, like the Deontay Johnson. I, I think Deontay Johnson is, um, I don't want to say like an Antonio Brown light, but he plays that. Uh, role in this offense and when Big Ben is back I think he could be a perfect downfield complement to what Juju Smith-Schuster is as a possession receiver over the middle and as a slot guy and he's someone that like I don't think people are really in love with because the production wasn't there as a rookie but you also should have expected that so now you can buy them at a discount because there won't be a lot of hype around them so just second year wide receivers in general is something that I would be targeting in um startup drafts especially like I think if I do a, another dynasty startup draft this year I might just reserve rounds three through like eight for second year wide receivers right like might even if I need to reach up and grab a, a Hollywood Brown in like the fourth fourth round or something like that like I almost think it's worth it because the long-term effects that are gonna that you're gonna have on your team are gonna be like five top 20 wide receivers going forward yeah, I know in my startup this past year, like Michael Gallup went in like the 10th or 11th round, which is like crazy because I think he should. Dude, I got Cortland Sutton in the fucking like 10th or 11th round too, which was, which was absurd at the time, but even more absurd looking back at it now. Yeah, all these guys that like you either think are in bad situations or just aren't good because they didn't produce in their first year end up being huge values. Like if you go out and buy Deontay Johnson for like a third round pick and he busts, so what? It's a third round pick. The guy you're going to pick in the third round is probably going to bust anyways. At least you took a chance on a guy. Or at least, yeah, or at least he's going to have a Deontay Johnson type rookie year where he wasn't really usable anyways. And then buy him back the next year. Yeah, you've got him past. Yeah, exactly. Just fucking keep recycling these things. He'll hit on more. That's a great strategy. Um, another guy that I'm completely in on buying, he's not a rookie, um, but he missed most of last year and most of this year is Kareem Hunt, uh, running back for the Cleveland Browns. The reason why I like him is because of his contract situation. And I'm not like some type of contract expert. I'm not going to act like I am, but he's a restricted free agent after this year. And I think it's going to be very telling what happens in him, to him this offseason. Restricted free agent means like a team can like uh, offer him a contract and the Browns have the chance to offer it. If the Browns don't match whatever offer he gets, it likely means the team acquiring him is going to use him as a workhorse because nobody's going to pay a running back to not be a workhorse unless, I mean, there's a couple of franchises that probably would do that. But on top of that, if the Browns match whatever somebody else offers, that means he's likely going to be a big part of the offense, big enough to like repeat the value he's having right now. And right now he's basically James White with like rushing upside. So I think whatever happens in him this off season, it'll show that he's going to be like a, at least a top 24 running back. And I think the fact that Nick Chubb is there and the fact that it's dynasty and people don't want to like buy into Kareem Hunt because he seemed like he's older because he's been out of the year, uh, out of the league for a year and he's behind a younger guy who's probably like a better player, like in real life. Um, I think it'd be all over buying him because he's still only 24 years old. He's going to be 25 next year. And just what he's shown on the field after sitting out, like he hadn't played football in a, in a uh, calendar year 
And he proved me completely wrong because he looks fantastic. He is like breaking so many tackles. He's great in the passing game. He scored like a touchdown in the red zone last week. Um, he's one of the better running backs in the league. And I kind of forgot that. Like, I think him being in Kansas City kind of overshadowed, overshadowed how talented he really is. So um, wherever he lands next season, even if it's still in Cleveland, um, I think he'd be a fine like flex play in dynasty leagues. And if he does go to a team like Tampa Bay or like Houston, who next year, uh, Lamar Miller and Carl Sider are off their contracts, they're unrestricted free agents. If he lands there, I don't see why he wouldn't be like a top 10 running back. Yeah, Kareem Hunt's basically the only player that the Cleveland Browns have used correctly in their offense. And he's looked great this year. And we've been saying this, uh, like me, Snacks, and Animal on, on Faith the Public have been saying this since the offseason, that Kareem Hunt's on this one-year deal. All he had to do was come back and show that he is still a quality NFL running back, and he's going to get a, a Jarek McKinnon-esque contract somewhere. So I would say that like that's the, it's a really good point because the contract that was going to come this offseason, I highly doubt the Browns will end up matching it. I mean, even if they do, though, he's, you still see him in a very good situation. He's so involved in this offense. We saw this past week that every single player, like David Njoku didn't play, but we saw uh, Jarvis Landry, we saw Odell, we saw Nick Chubb, and we saw him all eat. It's not like they can't all produce in this offense. And I think one more year under his belt for Baker Mayfield is just going to help this offense even more. Yeah, I, I would be very surprised if he resigns, only because like his agent's going to be looking to get him a three- or four-year deal. Uh, the Browns have – huge contracts for Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham on their books already. And they're obviously going to have to re-sign Baker Mayfield to a historic contract within the next year or so. Um, so I, I doubt they would invest a lot of money into the running back position when they already have Nick Chubb. And you could probably replace Hunt's you know, production with the pass catching back elsewhere, which leads you to saying that, yeah, he'll probably get a contract of three to four years as a, at least semi like a workhorse in a, another uniform, which is extremely valuable. So you, you probably have to buy Kareem Hunt between now and the end of the NFL season because as soon as free agency or as soon as the offseason starts, people are going to start looking at free agency. They're going to put two and two together. They're going to start thinking the same things that we're saying on the show right now and realize that Kareem Hunt's going to land somewhere in which he's going to get a fat contract. So his value right now is like here, which is very good. I would say it's like a six out of 10, but I don't see any way throughout the offseason that it actually dec decreases, right? You know, he's in a, either a good situation now or he's going to be in a better situation when he signs somewhere else semi-long-term. So Kareem Hunt as a buy, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm on board with that. Sticking with the running back, I'm actually curious to hear your opinion on who you would take um, in Dynasty going forward. Karen Johnson is a guy that it hurts me to put him on this list, but I, I am looking to sell Karen Johnson right now. I own a one Dynasty league, and I'm trying to get rid of him frantically. And there's, there's one huge reason. Now, we all wanted to see him be the workhorse in Detroit this year. The talent is there. So we wanted to see what would happen when he finally got that role. Matt Patricia was the guy kind of holding him back from being that workhorse in Detroit. Patricia wants a committee because he wants carry on to stay fresh. His rookie season, carry on kind of started to take over the work a little bit more as the season progressed. And then he gets hurt. Then he hurts the knee and he's out for the remainder of the season, like the last six weeks of the season or whatever. This, this offseason, Matt Patricia comes out, suggests that the Lions should limit Karrion Johnson's workload, right? There's a quote from him that says, I think it's a position-specific thing where those guys, they take a lot of hits. They're in those situations a lot where their bodies are taking some pounding. So you want to be conscious of how many plays they're getting, especially early on in the year. So it takes Matt Patricia nearly a year and a half to give the reins to Karrion Johnson. And then again, he gets hurt. So Matt Patricia was proven right. Two separate times on Carrion Johnson. So I see virtually zero chance that Carrion Johnson is not in a running back by committee in 2020 and for the rest of his time in Detroit. And I don't blame Matt Patricia at all, right? He was right. We were wrong. The guys who wanted to see him as a workhorse, clearly he can't hold up. And he has not been able to prove that he can stay healthy for a long time. And I, I have a quote from a fan-sided article dating back uh, a couple of years ago. Now, Karen Johnson's injury history goes all the way back to high school where he suffered both left and right shoulder injuries, a sprained MCL, a broken thumb, and that kept building up at Auburn. He suffered injuries to his ribs, hamstring, ankle, and again to his shoulder. And now we're seeing a ton of low, lower leg problems with Karen Johnson. So we all love the talent, but the injury concern is very real. And Matt Patricia knew this. He was concerned about giving him too big of a workload. And then once he did, Karen Johnson proved him right and got hurt. So I highly, highly doubt Matt Patricia needs to learn for a third time that giving Karrion Johnson too much work is going to lead to another injury. So if you could still get somewhere near RB1 value for a guy like Karrion Johnson, 
because he's still young and people might be like, oh, he's going to be back next year as a workhorse. Like, I don't see any path to him being like, he'll still be the guy, he'll still be the starter. But I see you're probably going to see a lot more 12 to 15 touch games in Karen Johnson's career moving forward than you are 18 to 22 touches. Yeah, he, I actually owned him in one of my dynasty leagues, and I traded him away a couple weeks back, which I don't think you'd be able to do it anymore. But I got Mike Williams and Derrick Henry for Carryon Johnson in a second-round pick. I would absolutely fucking kill for a, a Johnson for Derrick Henry swap right now. I don't know which side you're on, but I'd assume it's the Derrick Henry side. Just because we hate him so much, I wasn't sure which side. But, yeah, for sure. Like, Derrick, what is he, like 22 years old at this point, Carryon Johnson? And it's not like – I don't know. He hasn't had a lot of wear and tear because he didn't play too much in college. I know, I think during his uh, last season there, he only had like 199 carries or something like that. But the fact that he's getting injured this often and the coach is coming out and saying that he can't really handle the load, like I think he and Darius Geis are very similar in the fact that people are apprehensive about them because of their injuries. I think the he main difference is off there. He had uh, a monster workload his, his, his final year there. It was over. I right, lied. <laughs> stop, stop lying, though. <laughs> Big facts. Either way, he's he's been injured both his like seasons in the NFL. So I think the main difference between like him and Darius Geis isn't even necessarily about the injuries. I think it's like the quarterback situation because now again it's back to back seasons we've seen Matthew Stafford go down and they don't really have a guy like an heir to the throne there. I'm not sure how much longer Matthew Stafford is gonna be playing quarterback and that kind of like worries me that this team is gonna go from like wanting to be a contender to like complete rebuild. whereas like Washington's been in a complete rebuild stage. So I don't like the surrounding situation. I don't like the coach speak about him um, not being like a high volume type of player. And I don't like the fact that he hasn't been able to show uh, he can handle that workload. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not all in on him as I was going into this season. If you could sell him somehow for like a first round pick, even if it's late, um, even like an early 2022nd, I'd be all over that because I just don't think he's the player that we may have thought he was coming into 2019. Yeah, I'm probably about to send out like a – I've been trying to do package deals all, all morning, but I'm probably just going to send out carry on for straight up anyone that has a first-round pick in this upcoming um, in this upcoming class because I just I just hate the spot that, that we're at right now. Um, now, you have another Detroit Lion listed here, and I'm actually very curious to hear your take on this. All right, my main reason is Kenny Galladay. My main reason I want to sell Kenny Galladay right now is because, as I just said, that quarterback situation. Galladay is, like, sneaky old. He's going to be – he's 26 years old, or he's going to be 26 years old next year. So he's going to be spending, like, the prime of his career with either a banged-up Matt Stafford or a quarterback who isn't ready to play yet. And the fact that they're going to be, like, around, like, the ninth, 10th pick means they're probably not going to be able to get, like, a Joe Burrow or maybe even a Tua if another team wants to, like, sit him behind their starter and develop. If they're going to be running through a bunch of backup quarterbacks or somebody like Jeff Driscoll – during his prime, I think it's going to be wasted. And you could point to like AJ Green being wasted in his prime with uh, Andy Dalton and still producing. Sure, you could say that. And I guess he could go down that path. But I just, I don't know. I'm going to try to sell him if I have him because I'm not sure that this situation is indicative of a guy who has like top 10, top 12 upside year after year, especially with a quarterback who keeps getting injured and a wide receiver who I'm not sure like how long his shelf life really is. Like not many guys who like are size speed specimens last all that long like Demarius Thomas fell apart when he was 30 years old I just and like Calvin Johnson retired at what like 29 or 30 in the same team so um not saying that it's going to be the same path for him but like I think he's a great player in real life I just don't like the situation I think you could buy a guy like maybe Juju Smith-Schuster who has like a completely down season this year if you could make that flip for a guy who's like 22 years old in Juju Smith-Schuster I would do it um, I know Yannick has been trying to give me Kenny Galladay for Devonta Adams for months now, so I'm I'm not going to pull the trigger on that yet. <laughs> What'd you say? No, nah, I was just saying. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Yannick deal. Yeah. Um, so a, a lot of moving parts there. I I would say that the age thing is definitely a little bit concerned. I didn't realize he was that old. I'm looking at it now. He is over 26 years old right now. Um, so that kind of snuck up on us pretty quickly. I am not as concerned with the Matt Stafford injury as you are. I think you probably are buying into that a little bit too much because he dealt with it last year and then he came back this year and was as good as ever. And then obviously it happened again, but like, if this is not considered serious and he could just do exactly what he did this year, uh, again, and as I kind of precluded to with Karen Johnson, who knows what the running game is going to look like for the, for the near future. I, I think like Kenny Galladay is is kind of just too talented. We don't know what's going to happen with Marvin Jones either. I'm pretty sure this is 
uh, possibly his last year on his contract. And I'll look that up in a second. But Stafford signed through 2022. They cannot cut him after this year. They cannot cut him after next year. Um, and even in 2021, if they cut him after that year, they're taking $10 million in dead cap. They would have to wait till after 2022 to do it. So it seems like Matt Stafford is set up to be their quarterback for the next three or four years at the minimum. And by that time, Kenny Galladay will be about 29 years old. And obviously you're going to want to um, try to move him into a trade situation there. Cause that's about, you know, when the prime of most wide receivers start to dwindle a little bit. Uh, Marvin Jones is on the books until 20 after 2020, yeah, after the 2020 season, dead cap would be 2.6 million. And you can find all the dead cap uh, information and just any contract information overall on spotrack.com, S P O T R A C.com. And just look at team uh, contracts, payrolls, payrolls by position and top salaries and things like that. So it's a pretty nifty resource for y'all. So I don't know, you know, what happens with Marvin Jones, who's actually played really well this year, but Kenny Galladay could kind of work himself into a massive, massive target workload if they do end up moving Marvin Jones. So it's going to be interesting to see what moves this offense makes in the offseason because I feel like they are kind of gluing together random pieces to make this offense work, but I feel like they need more solidified um, solidified starters. So, I mean, I guess I, I understand the case, but I feel like it's relying too much on a Matt Stafford injury when this one is not as suggested as serious. Like if it was something that were like, yep, they put him right on the IR and it's going to be you know, a six to eight month return, a recovery timetable, I'd say at 31, 32, that's pretty scary for a quarterback. But the fact that he might play again this year doesn't make me as nervous. And I think Kenny Galladay is just a, just a super, super talented player. So I'm not necessarily looking to move him, but I think, um, but I think you made some, some valid points. So definitely with the age and everything. I appreciate that, Nick. I appreciate it. Yeah. It mostly hinged on Matthew Stafford's back, like year back to back years, no pun yeah. intended, bike to bike years with a back injury that, um, that made me a little bit nervous, especially with him, like maybe wasting his prime with a backup quarterback. But if Matthew Stafford is healthy, if you want to hold him to this offseason and see what Matthew Stafford's injury is, like Kenny Galladay is still producing fairly well with Jeff Driscoll. So it's not like people are going to be completely off on him if like somehow Matt Stafford pulls and Andrew Luck and retires. Um, if you just want to wait till the offseason and see um, if Matt Stafford is going to make a full recovery, then just hold on to Galladay. I think it's, it's not really a lose-lose. Um, where his value is going to fall too far if Matt Stafford does um, have a serious injury. But if you can ship him off for a younger guy and you're rebuilding and Kenny Galladay isn't as young as maybe you thought he was, um, I'd be in on that. But I agree. I think he's like a great player in real life. And if you're not bought into him being Matt Stafford being done for the rest of his career, which I kind of am, so maybe I'm a little reactionary. Um, yeah, I just hold on to him at this point. Yeah, I like that juju for Kenny Galladay swap you mentioned. I, I doubt you'll be able to pull that off in a dynasty league, but if that's on the table, because people are, I'm sure, going to be down on juju a little bit after this year, um, I would absolutely do that. I would even throw something else in on the Kenny Galladay side in order to secure juju. Juju is on this list as, as a kind of a buy low guy, and I, I don't, I'm not going to get too into it because it's just a very, very obvious buy low. He's one of the most dominant wide receivers in the NFL that we've seen at such a young age that, you know, that's just a very good predictive teller of what they should be in the NFL. I, I would say that if I'm a Juju owner, I'm a little bit concerned with the production this year. Uh, I feel like as someone who was, you know, widely considered a top three, maybe top five dynasty wide receiver um, in startup drafts this year, it was concerning that we couldn't see him, you know, do anything close to like dominating his team's offense while Big Ben was out. Like obviously he's been working with really shitty quarterbacks, but you'd still like to see him commanding like 27 to 29 percent of the target shares because if uh, you know if you look at any other elite wide receiver, you know the DeAndre Hopkins, the Julios, the Devontae Adamses, all those types of guys, if their quarterback, their starting quarterback goes down, they're still commanding 26 to 30 percent of the team's targets because that's how elite they are. But Juju, that didn't happen this year, and I, I you know obviously you like his prospects with Big Ben hopefully returning next year, and I think Juju will get back to form and he'll be a good buy low candidate. Um, and probably a good bounce back candidate for like redraft drafts next year. You might be able to get him at a discount. Um, but it, it was still a little bit concerning. I mean, he's so, so young that he has time to, you know, prove that uh, kind of storyline wrong. But where are you sitting on Juju? Like, I, I feel like people will just, you know, Dynasty's tough because there's no way to really like be uh, accountable for a lot of the things you say because you could always just throw another year onto the fucking window of like, no, he's still going to break out. Like for Tyler Lockett, I'm sure people were telling you to buy him for four years and it took him his fifth year for him to finally break out. So if you had Tyler Lockett, it's like, yes, you were correct. But like you also ate, you know, not that productive of years for three years. Last year was good, obviously, but um, the volume wasn't there. You get what I'm saying though. With Juju, it's like, 
I think feel like everyone's just like, oh yeah, easy buy low. That's it. But like, you can't really buy that low on Juju because he was a perennial wide receiver one, like high end wide receiver one for dynasty this year. And I think there are like a little, uh, some red flags to be cautious of heading into next year. Yeah. I think the main point uh, to bring home is he was trying to catch passes from Mason Rudolph. And when Devlin Hodges comes in and looks worlds better than you, I think that just speaks volumes to like what he was dealing with. And he's had a few injuries here and there this season. I know he had a toe injury that didn't keep him out, but he kept him like limited in practice. So yeah. I just think with his age and just the fact that he's like a big slot receiver, we've seen guys like Cooper Cup who doesn't have the best QB play. Uh, Tyler Boyd, who's like 6'2". He's not like like the most, I don't know how to say, like the strongest receiver like built-wise, but um, he's produced with Andy Dalton. So I'd be all over buying Juju Smith-Schuster. He's easily a top 10 dynasty receiver because you just look at how good he was at a young age. He turned 23 years old, was it, four days ago. So at the time of recording, so five. He is four years younger than Michael Thomas. He, he had 1,400 receiving yards in the NFL at the age of 21. And according to Player Profiler, Michael Thomas, his breakout age at Ohio State was 21.6 years old. So that just puts into perspective that he was dominating the NFL. And I know he had Antonio Brown helping take a, a little pressure off of him. But he was dominating like legit NFL players at the same age that Michael Thomas was still catching passes from who knows what at like Ohio State. So I'm completely in on buying him just because, like, even if he does struggle with quarterback play and they don't find their franchise quarterback for the next three, four years, or maybe Big Ben isn't healthy, if you throw three years away, I know that's, like, not a good point to bring home, but, like, he'd still be 27. It's just ridiculous how young he is, and I still think he'd be, like, a top 24 receiver if Duck Hodges was playing quarterback just because he's that big slot who's going to see 130, 140 targets, um, especially with Deontay Johnson growing as a player, James Washington taking a little pressure off of him. Um, I'm completely in on Juju Smith-Schuster just because you can't like you can't sewer his dynasty value because he had one bad season playing with third string quarterbacks. Yeah, I guess that's something that you need to take into consideration a little bit more. But yeah, I mean, like I said, it's just like even with the backup quarterback, you want to see that ratio kind of transfer over and be like, yeah, this guy was dominant on the field, regardless of who was uh, at quarterback, you know, at least like commanding targets. If the efficiency and the yardage and the receptions weren't there, that's okay because the quarterback was probably terrible and it was for Mason Rudolph. But like, I'd still like to see, you know, a, a few games where he was commanding 15 targets or so. But it just seems like it's been a crapshoot between Washington, Deontay Johnson, Juju Smith Schuster all year. But you just can't ignore how good he was at such an early age. Like, what, like you said, when Michael Thomas was still developing his body and dominating in college, Juju Smith Schuster was full grown man shit like dominating at age 21 which is just you know absurd so juju yeah if you can get him at any type of discount where you can get like a where you could flip a lower tier wide receiver one or like a mid wide receiver two or any of the running backs that we have talked about like in a package deal for juju obviously the shelf life for a wide receiver is much longer for dynasty leagues which is something you need to be very um you know, it, it, you need to look into very much when you're talking about ages, right? Because that's something you always have to bring up when we're talking about these players to flip. Like Juju, like when you look at Juju for DeAndre Hopkins or Juju for like Devontae Adams, you might be like, ah, I would never do that just because of the current situation they're in. But like Juju has an extra four years of being on your dynasty team. Um, so those things need to be very much taken into consideration. I think that will about wrap it up. So parting words. Be looking out for the Big Dogs Dynasty League draft guide, which will be dropping sometime in the offseason. It will cover all the prospect outlooks. It'll cover just general strategy. So if you bought the season long, the redraft uh, draft guide, a lot of the stuff in there was obviously player outlooks and things like that. But it was more general strategy, how to become a better um, you know, player overall and the best resources to be looking at when you're drafting and navigating through your league throughout the season and whatnot. That'll be a lot of the dynasty league content that we put out as well. So it'll be exponentially better this year than it was last year. Exclusive not- videos and stuff. I remember we did a few of those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Plus exclusive videos that you probably won't get on YouTube. Um, speaking of patreon.com slash BDGE is where you can get some other exclusive content. I'm sure we'll be covering some dynasty stuff throughout the off season on Patreon, which is, Uh, subscribers only a membership only platform so patreon.com slash bdge make sure you're following both of us on the twatter make sure you have hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new because we will be keeping up with fantasy dynasty all types of random behind the scenes content throughout the off season i'm super excited for off season content um 
So that is all I got for y'all today. I feel like that was a very good episode. I feel like we just fucking hit them with incredible. Yeah, that was like an hour long, but I'm going to check and see at 34 minutes. I know. My neck hurts. My back hurts. I feel like fucking Matt Stafford right now. Sell me. <laughs> oh. You good to go? Yeah, I'm ready to go.